Popular depictions of Wild West saloons have often portrayed them as hubs of vice and violence. These establishments were a common sight in the American frontier, found in small encampments and burgeoning towns alike. Functioning as information hubs, houses of companionship, and refuge points amid isolation and loneliness, these saloons played a vital role in the frontier lifestyle. Beyond mere recreation, saloons offered a means of sustenance, even offering a chance at wealth and prosperity on the frontier. The reality of historical Western saloons aligns with the anticipated imagery, gathering places for men interested in drinking, gambling, and an overall good time. However, the instances of gunfights were less frequent than often imagined, and the variety of experiences was considerably more extensive. Remember to hit the like button because it helps us a lot. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell to not miss the upcoming interesting videos. Saloons were for socializing, not gunfights. In contrast to the portrayals of saloons in popular media, these drinking establishments primarily served as havens for conversation and solace in the midst of the solitude that marked life on the American frontier. Young men toiling as farm laborers, railroad workers, and miners sought out saloons as vital social outlets. Upon entering a saloon, individuals had the opportunity to engage in discussions with fellow travelers or locals, conduct some business affairs, and relax while having a drink. Kelly Dixon, a researcher, delved into this topic and uncovered evidence that reinforces the idea that saloons were more centers of camaraderie than conflict. In the former saloon sites of Virginia City, Nevada, Dixon's investigations revealed a greater abundance of bottles, smoking pipes, and game boards compared to bullets or signs of violence. Homesteaders also grappled with prolonged periods of isolation, often striving to maintain their physical and emotional well-being through their labor. However, single men didn't have families to go home to at the end of a long day. Hence, saloon visitors might have also sought companionship during their time there. Saloons became major investment opportunities. Establishing a saloon in certain locales such as mining camps, individuals only needed a tent, a handful of seats and tables, and a supply of liquor. Yet, as settlements or towns progressed, investing in a saloon became a wise proposition for proprietors. This was particularly evident in towns situated along railway lines, Conversely, saloons that popped up in mining camps were more susceptible to failure when the gold or silver gave out. As communities flourished, the saloon count surged in tandem. When saloons became bigger, they moved into permanent structures and offered increasingly diverse forms of entertainment. Gambling offerings multiplied and the interior appointments became more refined. Soon after its establishment in 1858, Denver, Colorado boasted approximately 30 saloons. Come 1890, the city would lay claim to a staggering 478 of these establishments. Meanwhile, in Fort Worth, Texas, the advent of the White Elephant Saloon in 1883 marked a spirited competition among over 60 fellow drinking venues for the loyalty of patrons. Saloons acted as the center of newly founded boomtowns. As one of the first establishments to pop up in a frontier settlement, saloons undertook a multitude of roles. They stood as focal points for drinking, socializing, and unwinding, often became the focal point of an entire camp or town. In instances where a church was absent, the local saloon might double as a site for religious services, prompting a temporary pause in drinking and gambling as a gesture of def deference to visiting preachers. A case in point is Brighton, Colorado, where Reverend A.F. Heltman conducted his inaugural Presbyterian services in a saloon. Saloons embraced a broader societal role, accommodating community gatherings and even local elections. They fulfilled the role of information hubs, offering men not only employment opportunities but also a source of news and rumors. Acting as trading posts and accommodation, these establishments brought together individuals from all walks of life, serving as portals through which people entered and departed towns. Saloons across the West were not as ornate as Hollywood films suggest. Saloons often commenced as modest structures, 
essentially a wooden framework draped with canvas, an improvised shelter beneath which men could get engage in drinking, conversation, and games of chance. As saloons became more permanent structures, some might have boasted wooden flooring and harbored ornate bars. However, the majority retained a modest size, exuding a rustic ambiance. Saloons in major cities like San Francisco and Seattle may have had chandeliers and mirrors reminiscent of the stylized portrayal in Hollywood's rendition of the Wild West, but most were much more austere. Geographical context significantly influenced the decor found within saloons. Construction materials were often drawn from the immediate surroundings. For instance, a prairie town saloon might have exhibited sod walls adorned with spurs and saddles, while an establishment in mountainous terrain might have been characterized by woodwork embellished with animal bones, hides, and heads mounted throughout. In contrast, during the 1880s, the White Elephant Saloon in Fort Worth emerged as a two-story establishment that not only offered a culinary array of including fresh fish, oysters, and wild game, but also presented a selection of premium wines, liquors, and cigars. Women who weren't working girls or barmaids. Women fulfilled two primary roles within saloons, purveyors of alcohol and purveyors of companionship. In establishments that provided entertainment, women often graced the stage as dancers or theater performers, but sometimes the lines between the roles blurred. Malda Branscombe, known as Big Minnie, who exhibited her talents as an actress, barmaid, and sex worker in Tombstone, Arizona. Alongside her husband, she owned a theater during the 1880s. When it came to drinks, women adroitly persuaded men to indulge in costly spirits, usually getting a cut in the process. A nominal fee of 25 cents stood as the most economical way to treat a woman to a drink. If one took a five-cent drink and gave her the same, the bill was 25 cents. Within this sum, the establishment retained 10 cents and gave her a check for 15, which she cashed in at the end of the evening. To keep women from becoming too intoxicated, bartenders occasionally substituted tea for whiskey or diluted the libations. Women could also discard a drink in a nearby spittoon. Bartenders were highly esteemed at saloons. Bartenders at saloons were often the owners of the establishment, serving as security guard, drink provider, and orchestrators of amusement. Between 1860 and 1900, witnessed an astonishing surge in the ranks of bartenders and saloon owners on the American frontier, ballooning from a modest count of just under 5,000 to nearly 50,000. In the fiercely competitive realm of this profession, the race to secure top-tier talent was relentless. Expert bartenders garnered monikers such as professor or mixologist, designations that could readily apply to individuals like James Earp. James Earp worked as a bartender at saloons in Fort Worth and Wichita, Kansas in the 1870s, where he possibly directed patrons toward the adjacent Wichita brothel operated by his wife. Towels and spittoons were readily available. Seating within a saloon diverged from the bar itself, gravitating toward the tables where men gathered for conversation and games of chance. The absence of bar stools meant patron often stood as they imbibed, occasionally adopting a relaxed pose by resting one foot on the lower rail. Toward the front of the bar, hooks were affixed, providing a perch for towels. These towels, employed to wipe away beer from both mustaches and upper lips, regrettably saw infrequent laundering, inadvertently evolving into breeding grounds for germs and ailments. Indulging in smoking and chewing tobacco was an everyday occurrence at saloons. To prevent floors from being covered in spit and the like, proprietors placed cuspidors at various locations. When it came to using these spittoons, however, saloons seemed somewhat flippant. Signs bore the message, If you spit on the floor at home, spit on the floor here. We want you to feel at home. Dirt proved handy to soak up spilled beer, spat out tobacco, and any other fluids that made their way onto the floor of the saloon. In locales with wooden flooring, sawdust also found utility in this regard. Faro was the most popular way to gamble, followed by poker, roulette, and monte. 
Faro, a game that gained popularity in 17th and 18th century Europe, was commonly played in saloons throughout the American West. Poker was also a common game among cowboys in the frontier setting at, and at saloons. As certain saloons expanded their gambling offerings, they introduced progressively elaborate facilities, including poker tables, three-card monte, and roulette tables, forming a mosaic of entertainment choices. The outcomes achieved by gamblers varied significantly. The combination of drinking and betting often left cowboys and other saloon patrons deprived of their earnings. Nonetheless, this amalgamation of activities contributed to the distinctive saloon experience. Saloons were culturally diverse in newly found towns, but saloons stood as gathering spots for men from diverse walks of life, yet they lacked the commensurate racial inclusivity. As recounted in legendary watering holes, the saloons that made Texas famous, people who were African American, Native American, Latinx, or Asian were unlikely to be welcome in saloons because of prejudices. When settlements evolved into towns or cities, marginalized groups often built their own establishments. Thus, saloons tailored to specific ethnicities emerged, effectively catering to distinct drinker groups. Beside each other, saloons exclusively serving Irish immigrants, African Americans, and men of German heritage developed alongside each other. An instance in Virginia City, Nevada, unveils the Boston Saloon's opening to African Americans in 1864. William Brown oversaw its operations, and it garnered the attention of Mark Twain, who chronicled its popularity as a social nexus for the colored population while contributing to the Territorial Enterprise newspaper in Virginia City during that era. Saloons became targets for social reformers. Gambling, alcohol, and violence were common at many saloons. The interplay of the first two often spanned confrontations, with drunken men coming to blows in the wake of a perceived cheat at a gambling table. Instances of violence, such as the one on October 5, 1871, underscored this reality. Here, James Butler, Wild Bill Hickok, a Texas marshal, inadvertently took the life of a fellow lawman attempting to mediate a shootout. Tragically, Hickok himself met his demise within a saloon, the number 10 in Deadwood, South Dakota, in 1876. The story recounts how he, seated with his back to the door as he held a pair of aces and a pair of eights, known as the dead man's hand. It was then that Jack McCall shot Hickok in the back of the head. The late 19th century saw the surge of the temperance movement, heightening apprehensions surrounding saloons. Vigorous entities like the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union fervently campaigned to curtail drinking within these establishments. Leading this charge was the likes of Carry Nation marching into the saloons, axe in hand, to hack away at bottles, mirrors, and anything else in her wake. Gradually, piecemeal restrictions on alcohol, gambling, and prostitution were instituted across the American West. A nationwide prohibition followed in 1919, heavily influenced the place of saloons in society. A seasoned Arizona gambler remarked that by the early 20th century, reformers had altered the West into the milksop frontier. Please like and share if you find the video content interesting and useful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment below so as not to miss the upcoming interesting videos. Thanks for watching.